Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeremy White. I'm a VP of Engineering at Spot On, and today I'm going to go over one of my favorite movies, John Wick, uh, and some of the leadership traits I think that you can get out of the movie. So just curious, quick show of hands, how many people have actually seen the John Wick movie and know, know what this is? Oh, wow. Quite a few. Quite a few. Okay. So quick disclaimer. While this is a great movie, action-packed, I am not advocating violence <laughs> or convincing anyone to become an assassin. So we will look at some of the traits and some of the things that John Wick does and what he doesn't do and how you can use those same traits in order to kind of progress your own career in terms of leadership, especially when it comes to engineering. So uh, for those of you who are not aware, John Wick is an assassin. Uh, he is highly respected, probably one of the best, and he goes away in retirement for a woman. She passes away and he gets pulled back into the underground. So that's kind of the background of where, where he is and where we start to see how he starts coming to the, uh, into the fray again. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over some of those things about how his reputation preceded himself so well and how we can use that as a currency. Outcomes and how he focuses on that and those speak so much louder than words ever could. And his big credo is he's a man of focus, commitment, and sheer will. And I think those are, the same traits that a lot of us engineers as we become leaders should really focus on in order to be able to produce those outcomes that we, we all desire. And in the last point, we'll go over some of the actions as a leader that you can take to also promote those kind of environments where we start to see those things from other engineers. So within the movies, they have this concept of these coins. These coins have no monetary value. It's actually pretty interesting in that you can use it to stay at a hotel, to buy a drink, it covers a lot of different things, and really what it is is it's a social contract. Uh, you can think of this as the same type of thing with your reputation. As you have accomplishments and as you do things, you earn these coins, you earn this reputation. Now, that same thing holds true when you actually make promises. When you're making promises, when you tell people this is what I am going to do, you're actually spending some of that reputation, spending some of that currency. So when you look at it from that perspective that your reputation is treated as a currency, you need to make sure that you stay cash flow, cash flow positive, right? You need to be earning more of that reputation than you are spending it. There's also a case where sometimes maybe you did something five years ago and you really did crush it. But if you haven't done things since then, then you're still spending that currency and you're not actually bringing in any new currency. So again, when you look at that reputation, look at the outcomes, look at the things that you're trying to actually accomplish, because the words that you use, those are the promises. Those are what you're gonna spend some of your reputation doing. And if you spend too much time making promises and not delivering, again, you'll run into a situation where you've lost that reputation and you have a hard time actually convincing people um, to be able to help you make those accomplishments moving forward. So one of my favorite lines in the movie is uh, when Vigo here, his son is the one that actually, spoiler alert, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, his son kills John Wick's dog and steals his car. Not a good move. He did not know who John Wick was. So when, when his son, Yosef, takes the car into the shop to scrap it, basically uh, the owner there recognizes whose car it is and immediately hits him and says, bad call. Now. The interesting part of this is when Yosef's father, Vigo, makes a call to say, why did you hit my son? Because he's, he's a big mobster, he's well known in the industry. He, he asks him, why did you do that? And he says, well, John Wick, he killed John Wick's dog and stole his car. That's all he said. And the one-liner that comes out is just, oh. This is, and you hear this throughout the movies, and I love this because it's what isn't said. It's just that one word, oh. When you recognize what someone's capable of doing and what they have done, you immediately understand the ramifications. That's where your reputation can take you. When you start to build up that reputation and you leverage that, those are the answers you get. We've all had people on the teams when you say, we've got this really big problem, who are we gonna send after it? And you name that one person and immediately, You'll, you'll see some of the execs or someone go, oh, whew, it's that sigh of relief, right? Because those people have earned enough reputation to be able to carry that forward and to be able to give that confidence in, in what can be done. 
And this really all comes down to words don't matter. We talked before about how you can use some of those promises and you can spend some of that currency to be able to use words and convince people. I see this happen too often today where we, we make a lot of the promises. We'll, we'll sometimes do a sales pitch of what, here's what could be, here's what, why we should do this. But at the end of the day, that only gets you so far. Eventually those catch up to you. What really works are the outcomes. Those are what we should strive for. What, are we, what value are we ultimately providing? Those outcomes are what will allow us to be able to move much farther, much faster. Again, the words are only gonna get you there for a little bit to buy you some time, especially if you're new to a position, new to a team. Sometimes you do need to spend a little bit of that currency up front just to be able to kind of build up some of that trust. But eventually you get to the point where others are the ones that are actually making those claims for you. Now, the interesting thing about Aurelius in the last uh, the last slide was that when he, he's the one that called and did all the bragging effectively about John Wick, not necessarily bragging at that point, it was just more calling out that this is who it was, you know, your son basically got himself into a big mess because of that. That's someone else speaking for John Wick. He never had to say a word. And this is really summed up really well when, when, when Vigo does make a call to John Wick to try and calm down the situation. And, and try to, he has a whole conversation with him. And if, and if you listen, through, throughout the whole thing, John Wick never says a single word and eventually just hangs up. And Vigo's assistant asks, so what did he say? Enough. He literally did not have to say a word because you already knew. When you build up that reputation, when you know what those outcomes that are going to come out of your when you become a top performer, when you become one of those people that can be trusted with handling the big jobs, you know the outcome that's going to come. It's, it's essentially a given. And it took time and effort for him to be able to build that up, but these are the types of things as leaders we should be doing. We should be building up that reputation. And the real interesting thing is, is most engineers just wanna solve problems. They don't want to go out and get accolades. So they, they, sometimes they enjoy getting accolades. They don't give themselves accolades. I see a lot of engineers that just move on to the next problem because it's a puzzle. Most of us enjoy solving those puzzles. And so what's important as leaders is that we recognize that we need others to help build up that reputation for those engineers that are getting the outcomes. That's our responsibility as leaders to make sure that we recognize when that's happening and call that out and give value where it's due. So this brings us to the credo. John Wick is a man of focus, commitment, and sheer will. These three traits, in my opinion, are the things that will help you build up that trust, build up that reputation, and get you to that point where you can progress in your career and you're not having to do as many battles to convince people. Because again, they've seen your outcomes. They know what you're capable of. So the first one is focus. Now, this isn't everybody, but in my opinion, I think most engineers are single-threaded. <laughs> we like to handle one thing at a time, we, we get super focused, and then we like to move on to the next thing. While we're capable of juggling things, I think most of us don't do a great job at it. We can, but then we can't really get too deep in it. Anyone that's been in the flow or in the zone when they're coding or trying to solve a problem can understand how productive you can be in that time of frame or time frame of just that pure focus. And so one of the things we need to do is try to limit how many things we're focused on. The more we're limited, the more we're focused, and not just as you know, an individual, but as a team, the more we're focused on one thing, the more we can get through that faster and the higher rate of success that we're gonna have with that. Now, part of the things, that, one of the things that'll help with this is a light process. And I use the term light process because too often nowadays we have all these heavy processes where the process becomes the work. The process is intended to help guide us and make sure that we're not getting off the rails to make sure we are keeping our focus. So make sure you have something in place. And again, these are gonna be different solutions for different people. I'm not, I'm pretty pragmatic when it comes to that. I don't think there is that one size fits all. You have to evaluate where your team is and what processes they need to keep them on the rails and keep them to the point where they're building that reputation, where they're building those outcomes. The other thing I like is to focus on the finish line, not on how you get there. I think too often, we provide tasks to engineers. Someone will break down the work and you have such minute little pieces of work that really you're just, you're just typing out the code that's almost in the requirements document. 
I'm a big fan of really setting that finish line, letting them know where we're trying to go and why we're trying to get there. The more you know that, the more the engineers are empowered to be able to make the right decisions to get to that finish line. The analogy I like to use is sometimes they may take a boat, a train, a car. It's up to them, right? What we want to do is make sure that that's where we're trying to get to. Those are the outcomes that we're looking for. I trust you. I hire smart people to be able to make the right decisions to get us there. It may not be the way that I would have chosen to do it had I been in that position, but I'm trusting and enabling people to make sure that they are empowered to be able to get there on their own. Now, one of the analogies here that will not work too well with John, uh, with John Wick is he is a bit of a lone wolf. I do not recommend that. Uh, in particular, when we talk about setting these finish lines, they should be for teams. I'm a big fan of swarming on things and getting a collaborative effort at trying to solve problems. So while John Wick does tend to go out on his own, he gets a little bit of help here and there. Um, I would discourage that type of lone wolf mentality where you've got one person doing things because if you ever want to do something else or if you want to, ever want to go on vacation, you've now just pigeonholed yourself into a challenge where you can't because you're the only person that knows that or is capable of doing that. So always, always work with teams as much as you can. Now, one example I had is I had a team that I worked with that was stuck in a very reactive nature. Um, they, they were getting so much support issues, so many bugs, so many challenges coming in that they didn't really feel like they could get any progress on the, fixing the underlying problems. And so one of the things we did is to help drive some of this focus, we split into three effective teams and then we rotated focus on those teams. One team, each sprint, would take on all of the reactive work. They'd focus on that. They'd create whatever automation that they could during that time frame to be able to kind of identify, create supportability tools. But that was their 100% focus is just purely on the reactive work. What this unlocked was everyone else's ability to be able for that those two weeks to really focus and really deliver some outcomes. And being able to enable that is again what, what helped them build their reputation and help build more of the now when they went to product and asked, you know what, we need to spend a little time on this tech debt, they built up that trust. They showed what they can do if they can get that level of focus. So look for those opportunities where you can really focus on something and really try to drive through to those outcomes. Try not to do too many of those things at once. Commitment, this is, this is a big one. When you talk about trust, this is probably one of the biggest biggest ones because at the end of the day, uh, most of us engineers, myself included, are horrible at predicting how long it will take something, estimating. But at the end of the day, what we do need to do is be able to commit to what those outcomes that we're looking for. Now, that direction may change. And again, that's okay. I think we as, as an industry need to get more and more adaptive to when reacting to the change when it does come about. But at the end of the day, when we commit, that, that's really important. And when I say commit, I don't mean just hit the finish line even if the car has been destroyed the entire time. You need to focus on quality. One of the worst things you can do is hit that timeline and cut every corner imaginable because you will have to pay that debt later on. That will not actually hit the outcomes that you're looking for. You'll end up paying back tenfold in that later on when you're trying to fix it. When, when product and everyone else has already moved on to other things and they want to do other things, you're having to go back and fix that. And it becomes a very difficult uh, thing to be able to, uh, uh, to convince that kind of prioritization. Another one that I see is this uh, disagreeing and still committing. I, I think as engineers, we all have unique ideas about how we can solve things. And, and I think that's the diversity of ideas is one of the best ways to find out the best, the best solution. We have to be careful though, not to get caught in the trap that either it, I didn't build it or it's not done my way. When we do make a commitment, we can recognize it may not have been the way that we would have chosen. We can recognize that it may potentially fail and it may have some flaws, but when a decision is made and we've committed as a team that that's, that's what we're going to do, we need to go well in and, and, and totally commit to that. Because without that, there is no alignment. And, and a team that is not aligned is guaranteed failure. That's probably one of the most critical things is making sure that everyone is going in a common direction. And the last thing on this is setting clear expectations. When you make a commitment, how you make that commitment and what you commit to is really important. If it's ambiguous in any way, you're, you're doomed for failure there because what you think you're delivering might be exactly what's being asked of you. 
But if the person asking it is thinking something totally different, then you're both going to be disappointed. So one of the really important things to do here is to be clear on what you intend to accomplish. And if at any point it's not looking like you're going to be able to do that, or if there was any ambiguity in what that was, be transparent. If you, if you overcommit, be clear. Don't wait until the due date to say, oof, we fell behind a while ago. Be transparent. We don't always get it right all the time, but when we commit, we need to be transparent about where we are at it and be honest with that, because I think that that's the best way forward for everyone. Now, an interesting uh, scenario I was in is, uh, it, was, it was a very unique project and one of my favorites, actually. We moved a several large global data centers into a cloud service. Now, uh, the initial ask was we had to get out of all of the data centers that we had, and we had hundreds of servers, and it was not going to be a small move. And initially, what they wanted to do was going to be a much smaller shift just to another area, to a different data center. We had the opportunity to be able to, to suggest, while we commit to being able to move out of that data center, it's an opportunity to start taking advantage of automation, start taking advantage of auto scaling, and a lot of the cloud type of things that, you, that, that we want to see in our more modern day applications. Now, the reason I bring this up is because that context of that commitment is really important. What we committed to is getting out of the data center. Right? The opportunity we had, though, was to be able to promote more automation, more auto scaling, more cloud first type technology. Now, eventually what happened is what became an 18 month project got shrunk down to about a 10 month project as more often than not things tend to do. And because we had such clear expectations of what we were committed to versus what our opportunities were, all of the engineers were knew exactly what we needed to do in order to hit that finish line. Because again, while we wanted all of the automation, we wanted all of the auto scaling, we recognized that once we hit that shorter timeline, partway through the project that we were going to have to make some adjustments. So we still hit moving out of the data centers, but we only got about 60 or 70% of the automation and the auto scaling that we wanted to do. And what I like about that is that, again, what, what we committed to and what our opportunities are, we, we can't conflate those. While we want to do them, and we did ask for time afterwards to be able to go back and fix some of the automation that we missed, we made the right call in terms of where our, our commitments and where our, expe our expectations were. So keep in mind what your, your commitments are when you're making them and help use those to help make your decisions as you move forward. Now, the third of the, the, the traits, that, and this is perhaps one of my favorites, is sheer will. Now, this is the determination to succeed. I, this is genuinely one of my favorites. I love seeing this in people. You, when you see that thirst, that hunger for being able to solve problems create, creatively, th that's a skill that's often difficult to teach, often innate. You can definitely encourage people to do that. You can put them in environments to help that, but these are the things that internally you need to figure out what that drive is. At the end of the day, plans go awry. Things rarely work out the way that we expect or that we plan to. And what I love about the will aspect of this is that you, you're prepared to improvise. In the movies, we see John Wick without a gun, so he leverages a belt, a book, and one of the most popular, a pencil. These are not exactly the tools that someone, an assassin, is going to go out and ask for. Can I get, you know, a dozen pencils because I've got a mission to do? These are the things that sometimes you get tools that are not the ideal tools, but we work with them. It's what we have. We, we produce the outcomes. We build that reputation, and then maybe we spend some of that currency that we just built up with that to promote getting some of those tools next time. What I don't like seeing is when we say, sorry, I can't because that's not the perfect tool. Sometimes we have limitations. We have to work within those limitations and sheer will is what allows you to get over and around those limitations, but recognize what they are and be able to circle back to them. A lot of this is being, is really comes down to having the courage because the courage, the creativity and moving past that fear of failure not worrying about, yes, with a pencil that might go very wrong, but still having that willpower to be able to try it, see if it works, and continue to be persistent at hitting those commitments that you made. Now, I had the honor of working with a team. Actually, there was about 10 of them that had made a change completely in their career. Now, they went through a boot camp, took them about six months. These were people that were, one was an accountant, 
One was a restaurant server, one was an IT person, one was even a pastry chef. And what was unique about them is they all had this will. They didn't come in with the knowledge of development. They didn't come in with the experience. They went in through a six month training program to become a developer, to become an engineer. And that will carried them through there, that courage to completely change your career. You may have gone to college for something totally different. You may not have even gone to college, but you were brave enough to be able to try that new path to be able to put yourself out there and to be able to do whatever it takes in order to be able to, to, to get to those outcomes. That's the kind of thing I think that we should hire for, that we should look for, that we should encourage and promote amongst all of us is that level of bravery, that level of courage, um, and ultimately just recognizing that will and really rewarding it when we see it. Now, as leaders, we need to be able to promote scenarios that allow this type, encourage this type of activity where people can build that reputation so that they have the currency to spend. Winston here is one of the characters that runs the Continental. Now, what's interesting about this is it is a safe haven. There's no business allowed on the grounds. It gives them that safe space to be able to recover, to be able to get the, the tools, the things that they need, and that, as leaders, is what we are to the rest of our team. And again, when I say leaders, I use the term very generically. I think too often in our industry, we assume that simply managers are leaders or whatever your role makes you a leader. I don't believe that's the case. I believe the leadership title is earned. It's much like the respect that we talked about. It's empowering others, putting them in situation, becoming multipliers to help them get better. That is how you can out outperform any one individual. As an individual contributor, you can only do so much. You hit a certain point where you will plateau. Every one of us will. But the more you can get those same skills and encourage and build those skills up in others, you can multiply that. You can make a far bigger difference helping, encouraging, and growing others. And again, you do not need to be a manager to do this. One of the things as leaders I think that uh, uh, is probably one of the most important that we do is be the loudest voice for them. We see this with John Wick throughout the whole movies. He rarely says a word about what he's done, who he is. He, he says his name. That's about it. Everyone else is the one telling his story. Everyone else is the one convincing why you need to worry about this person or why you want this person on your side. We as leaders need to be that for our engineers, for our staff, for when we see, not even our staff, when we, it's our colleagues, anyone. When we see someone producing outcomes and really helping us get to that next level and really building that up, we need to do our part to make sure that that's recognized. Because again, they've probably moved on to the next interesting problem because that's what most of us really enjoy doing. We're not out there to promote ourselves. We're not out there to be able to say, here's what I've done. So be that voice for others, especially when you don't see them doing it for themselves. The other thing I think is strategizing and prioritizing for a path of opportunities. We don't have to come as leaders to someone with all the solutions, but we can put them in positions to be able to drive towards solutions and drive towards outcomes that really help promote themselves. And this can be a little bit interesting and tricky at first, but trying to get them to think for themselves, to make decisions for themselves, to trust them. That's why we're hiring smart people. That's why we surround ourselves with smart people. Most, most of us enjoy working with the absolute best people. And that's what promotes more greatness. And so the more we get ourselves in these opportunities and, and put people in these opportunities to be able to prove themselves, they get to build up that credit of their own they get to build up that reputation and now you can sit back and then they already have the trust they need and they can start doing that for, for the next group of people. That's how you raise a whole team and not just an individual. The, probably one of the hardest things too is sometimes watching and letting them fail. Now I'm a firm believer in still having some guardrails and making sure that a failure is not too much, but, but I think you especially start to see that people, you can tell them or explain to them, this is the best solution possible. And it may be, or it may not be. But at the end of the day, I think most people tend to find out on their own a lot better. So as long as it's not in one of those situations where it's unrecoverable and you, they're, they're going to be an epic failure, those we probably want to try our best to avoid. 
But it is, it is important to let people fail a little bit and, and let them know it's okay. We encourage failure. My argument is if you're never failing, you're never learning. How many times when you go through something and you look back at a success, do you really interrogate and find out, did I do everything correctly there? Rarely do we. Sometimes we got lucky, but we rarely interrogate how we made the right decisions. When we fail, on the other hand, that's a different story. We often sometimes obsess about it. Uh, when there's an outage, this is why we go through RCAs, we go through postmortems. We look back at how can we prevent this from ever happening again? You need those failures to build that muscle to be okay with failure on occasion. Still find it unacceptable, right? We want to drive towards perfection, but recognize that it is not fully attainable. So what's your story? Mine, my preference, I like to be authentic, honest, and straightforward. That's my approach. I think that resonates very well with one of the, one of the uh, uh, scenes in the movie where Vigo finally gives up with the location of his son to John Wick. And he says, you, they know you're coming. And his response, of course, but it won't matter. And that's, again, the power of the confidence of building up that currency of your, your reputation and knowing that, yes, you will be able to attack any of the most impossible challenges and work through them. So what's your story? What are you doing that helps build up your reputation? What are the outcomes that you've done? Come stop by at the Spot On booth. We're just outside here. Uh, we are looking for people to be able to join our community. And if so, if you have that focus, that commitment and the sheer will, or those are just skills that you're looking to be able to pick up, then please come stop by and give us a call. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.